Yes. Okay. okay. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to um, listen to my webinar. And tonight we'll be talking about managed care pharmacy. Um, Mary went over the objectives already. So let's get right to it. Um, so health plans, a little bit of background. There's three main types of drug plans. So you have um, your commercial plans, which are, you know, your uh, type of insurance that you get from your employer, and then also insurance purchased on the individual market, um, like the exchange plans, things like that. Then you have Medicare, which is where I currently live. Um, Medicare, anyone uh, 65 years and older in, in the United States is eligible for Medicare, um, regardless of income or anything like that. Um, Medicare also does include, and, and that's most people in Medicare, but Medicare does also include um, adults ages 18 to 64 that are eligible for Social Security disability income. Um, so these are people that are disabled, you know, they may have things like multiple sclerosis, very serious mental illness, that kind of thing, um, things that will keep them from working. And then also anyone with end-stage renal disease, anyone on dialysis is also eligible for Medicare regardless of age. And then the third type of drug plan is Medicaid. Um, Medicaid is for low-income people. Um, it's half paid for by the federal government and half paid for by the state government, and each state determines eligibility, so it's different from state to state um, depending on your income, and some states are a little bit more generous than others. Um, there, are all, there are also um, a population of patients we call dual eligibles. These are people that qualify for both Medicaid and Medicare, so usually it's people that are 65 and older and low-income at the same time. So what is the role of pharmacists in managed care plans in, the, in these three plans that we just discussed? Um, for the kind of the main answer to that question, we have to look at the trends in drug development. So I'm sure some of you have heard about what, um, what kind of the media is calling the patent cliff. Um, so you have these great big blockbuster chronic drugs like Lipitor, Plavix, things like that, that all seem to have gone off patent in the last you know, five to ten years or so. And um, we don't really see a whole lot of drugs like that in the pipeline. Um, drug companies are kind of moving away from these kind of chronic drugs for these more kind of everyday conditions. And they're really directing their R&D pipelines mostly towards oncology drugs, orphan drugs, and drugs like hep C, you know, like drugs like the hep C drugs that are priced like orphan drugs but are not truly orphan drugs. Um, so obviously, you know, somebody kind of you know, healthcare is always a limited resource. It's always going to be a limited resource, and somebody needs to kind of manage this utilization to make sure healthcare resources are used um, in the best way possible. Also, medications are becoming much more co complex. Um, you see this a lot with the oncology meds. Um, we are kind of entering, you know, baby steps, but we are kind of entering the area of personalized medicine where a lot of these oncology drugs are also coming along with genetic tests and you have to have that certain genetic issue for the drug to even work. And um, Zelbaraf for malignant melanoma is a perfect example. Zelbaraf will only work in malignant melanoma patients who have this certain V600E BRAF mutation. Um, if the patient, you know, you do the genetic test, if the patient does not have that mutation, the drug will not work. And um, I think this is kind of a good thing because, you know, you're kind of taking away some of that trial and error type, um, you know, problems that we've had in the past, and you're hopefully using um, this very costly drug only in people in which it will really help them. And then, you know, again, going back to the judicious use of scarce healthcare resources, um, let's rewind back to 1987, AZT, the first drug ever approved for uh, the treatment of HIV. Um, its original cost was $8,000 a year, and people were absolutely scandalized. How can a drug be that expensive? Well, now, you know, we're kind of nostalgic for those days when the most expensive drug was $8,000 a year. Um, fast forward to 2007, Soliris, which is a drug um, for, you know, again, I believe this is an orphan disease, um, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, half a million dollars a year. And then again, I mentioned, you know, the hep C meds earlier, those, you know, were approved last year, Savaldi among some other ones. Um, those are all over the news. Um, they're even um, inspiring, you know, congressional testimony on why are these drugs so expensive. Um, drugs like Savaldi are over $1,000 a dose. And um, I did a little research as to kind of what is um, coming down the pike. Um, there's a drug called Gly Glybera. It has not been approved in the U.S. yet, but it was approved last year in the European Union. 
it is over 1 million euros, not dollars, but euros a year. And right now a euro, I believe, is worth about $1.15. So, um, and you know this is coming to the U.S. So again, you know, as we all know, drug prices are basically completely out of control. And um, this is another uh, area where managed care pharmacy can really, um, you know, help use those scarce resources in the best way possible. And how do we do that? So um, we try and use evidence-based medicine as much as we possibly can, and then also um, the use of treatment guidelines. And um, these are kind of, I, I actually um, threw this PowerPoint um, around to some of my coworkers and had them come up with um, some examples. Um, the, actually, the epigen and the synergists are my own personal examples. Um, I used to actually work in a Medicaid plan before I got into Medicare. And um, I used to see inappropriate use of epigen all the time. It seemed like everybody who was on dialysis, they would just give them a regular dose of epigen, kind of regardless of what their hemoglobin was, which is not only incredibly wasteful, it's also very dangerous. And, um, you know, I do think that, you know, that inappropriate use was also probably linked to um, dialysis centers getting reimbursed for um, distribution of that drug. So you see a lot of, I saw a lot of abuse there. Um, Synergis is another example where I saw a lot of non-evidence-based use. Um, again, when I was in the Medicaid plan, Synergis is a drug that's uh, used for, uh, against respiratory syncytial virus. It's a vaccine, sorry. And um, you vaccinate, you know, usually premature infants with it because they're at an uh, increased risk of respiratory syncytial virus. And um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has very specific guidelines about the use of Synergis. You know, the child has to be so, you know, so many weeks premature, I, you know, I haven't done it in a while, I, I believe there's a weight requirement too, um, but the guidelines are just really crystal clear, and I saw so many cases where the child very clearly did not fit in the guidelines, and I mean, the guidelines, I mean, they're available on the internet, I mean, they're published everywhere, so, um, you know, we turned down a lot of synergists, and the cost of synergists was so much for my particular plan that if we kind of had a month where we had a lot of um, approvals for synergists, um, drug plans measure their drug costs in a thing called uh, PMPM, per member per month. So like, you know, how much did you spend on drugs divided by your members, and that's how much did you spend on drugs per member that month. And, you know, PMPM, most drug plans monitor that number pretty closely. Um, my plan, if we had a lot of synergist approvals that month, our PMPM would significantly rise. That's how expensive that drug was and how much of an effect it had on overall drug spend. So, um, you know, curbing inappropriate use of that drug was really important. Um, also, testosterone, I'm sure a lot of you um, out in the community have seen this also, you know, men that have normal testosterone levels, but they just, you know, want to feel young or, you know, or that kind of thing. And so the doctor puts them on testosterone, which is completely inappropriate. And it happens all the time. We see it in managed care a lot. Um, so, you know, what are some of the tools that um, managed care pharmacists use to kind of control this inappropriate use of medications? Um, we kind of define all these tools kind of group together for what we call utilization management. Um, and again, a lot of you who work in community pharmacy, I'm sure, are very familiar with this. Um, the first one is quantity limits. Um, opiates is obviously the biggest use of quantity limits. Um, but we also use it for things like um, triptans and, quite honestly, any other acute treatment for migraines. You don't want people using um, acute treatment of migraines more than something like nine times a month. If they are using it more often than that, they're at risk for medication overuse headache, and they really should be on uh, migraine prophylaxis. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's definitely a safety concern as well. And then specialty meds, you know, for obvious reasons of cost. Um, and then step therapy, again. Those of you in community are very familiar with this. Um, you've got to try and fail the cheaper generic before you get the expensive branded drug. And one of the classic examples is, you know, a plan may require you have to try and fail generic Zocor and or Lipitor before you get Crestor. Um, and then another part of uh, utilization management is prior authorization. This is criteria that must be met in order for a member to receive a drug. And again, community, you, are, you guys are very familiar with this. I know when I worked in community, I um, had to kind of help along PA, uh, PA uh, requests pretty much every day. Um, and depending on the drug, um, PAs can be fairly straightforward or they can be incredibly complex. Um, usually they require 
They may require uh, test results, usually more recent test results, um, chart notes, um, adherence to a previous drug regimen or also a specific diagnosis since, you know, a lot of drugs have multiple uses and we don't know why they're using it um, necessarily. Um, and, and the adherence to drug regimens, too, is a big thing. Um, I know, again, when I worked for the Medicaid plan, when I was doing prior authorization requests, um, you know, a lot of times a doctor would put in a PA request for an expensive drug and, you know, the, usually the first thing you do is you check and make sure, you know, were they taking the cheaper drug? And then you look and they haven't filled the cheaper drug in six months. And you call the doctor's office and you say, you know what, I, I can't, you know, I can't approve this more expensive drug. They're not inherent with the cheaper drug. And it was, the doctor's office was always shocked that, that the member was, not, the patient or member was not inherent. So um, that's, a, you know, again, another kind of tool in the toolbox for the managed care pharmacist to um, help use healthcare resources more judiciously. And also, you know, we're fighting against this kind of perception from the general public and, you know, possibly some physicians, too, um, and it might even be unconscious that newer and more expensive means better. And in many cases, that has turned out not to be true. Um, I actually have a personal story about Vioxx. Um, I had bunion surgery on my foot many years ago, and, you know, my foot was all inflamed and red. And um, the doctor just wanted to put me on some sort of anti-inflammatory for, like, you know, two weeks or something. And instead of giving me ibuprofen over the counter, he wrote me a script for Vioxx. And um, I took it to the pharmacy, and my insurance would not pay for it. Um, because, gee, why don't you just try good old ibuprofen? And um, I went back, to, you know, this was way before I went into pharmacy school or anything, so I, I had no idea. And I went back to the doctor and, um, you know, told them what happened, and then they gave me a bunch of free samples of Vioxx, a drug I wish I had never taken. And um, I actually told that story to get my first managed care job, and it worked. So, um, so you know, these rules are here for a reason. They're not just here to make people's lives hard. Um, you know, yes, they are here to conserve resources, but they're also for patient safety. Um, one of my professors in pharmacy school used to say, you know, if you can help it, try not to use a drug that's been on the market for less than five years unless it has a really significant edge over other drugs. And um, in general, I think that's a good piece of advice. Plus, we're also fighting against, you know, over-the-counter advertising. I mean, um, direct-to-consumer advertising, which most countries in the world ban. Um, that's, that's kind of been an issue, too, with people asking for drugs that are maybe not in their best interest. So um, another thing that uh, managed care pharmacists definitely get involved with is the formulary. Um, every hospital has a formulary, and every managed care plan has a formulary as well. It's just kind of the list of drugs that you cover or take care of. And the formulary is decided by the P&T committee, the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee. Um, and again, this is kind of the same between hospitals and um, health plans. Um, the P&T committee is made up of pharmacists, physicians, and nurses. And um, it's a regular meeting. Usually, um, most P&T committees meet about quarterly, and they decide what drugs are going to be covered, the PA criteria, um, how the drug is going to be tiered. So, you know, you have something on a low tier, it's usually a cheap generic, and then a higher tier is one of these, you know, really expensive specialty meds, and that's when the PA criteria and stuff is going to come into play. And then also comparative effectiveness ratings, um, you know, is this new awesome drug better than, you know, the old standby, um, you know, uh, comparative effectiveness research can be very hard to come by, but I'm hoping, you know, we'll see more of it um, as the, the concept of comparative effectiveness comes into favor. And one thing that, quite honestly, I didn't know anything about until I got into managed care are rebates. And a rebate is an agreement between a drug plan and a pharmaceutical manufacturer. Um, this is only done with multiple branded products that are very similar, like, you know, two asthma inhalers or, you know, two statins that work, you know, reasonably the same way. And what happens is um, the health plan makes an agreement with the pharmaceutical manufacturer so that the health plan gets a payment from the drug company in exchange for preferential formulary treatment for manufacturer's product. So if you ever see, again, two very similar branded products and, you know, the, managed care, the, the, the health plan covers one but not the other or one of them's tier four and the other one's tier three, um, you can, it's probably a pretty safe bet that the health plan got some sort of a rebate 
from the manufacturer of the preferred brand. Um, all plans do this. It's a big, you know, it, it, it really can save a plan, you know, a lot of money. And, um, you know, in two drugs where the therapeutic difference really isn't there, um, you know, we feel it's, you know, fairly, uh, it, it's a necessary tool. And again, you know, all the plans do it. And, you know, if, if a patient really just cannot take the one brand, they can always, um, you know, get a PA request for the other brand. And then some rebates also depend on the majority percentage of a plan's members using a drug in comparison to a competitor's drug. So, you know, if you have to switch a bunch of people over to, you know, the rebated drug, you know, you may not get the rebate unless you get, you know, 50% of your people, to, your members to switch. Um, and also, um, sometimes it's for, um, it, it sometimes can be also for um, several different drugs made by a certain manufacturer. And again, you know, it's only going to be for branded products where there's a competitor to that brand that's pretty similar. But again, all plans do this, and um, it's just kind of, again, one of the tools we use to kind of keep costs down and to help, you know, try to keep premiums low for everybody. Fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, obviously, I would say kind of the biggest issue with fraud, waste, and abuse is opiate abuse. As everyone knows, this is a huge problem. Um, the last uh, statistic we read is 75% of all drug overdose deaths are due to prescription drugs, not street drugs. However, um, I'm kind of wondering if in the next maybe five years or so we're going to see this um, kind of go back to street drugs, um, especially due to things like um, all the hydrocodone products, you know, Vicodin, Lortab, all of those um, going up to Schedule 2. We are kind of seeing a spike in heroin usage because, believe it or not, heroin is not, in, in some places is now cheaper and easier to get than Vicodin or Lortab. So, um, unfortunately, we are, you know, not that, uh, you know, I want Vicodin to be easier to get, but um, I think it's kind of going to be an unintended consequence of making things like Vicodin and Lortab um, harder to get and more expensive. Um, we are probably going to see, unfortunately, more heroin use. Um, you know, people are addicted, and they'll do whatever they need to do to, um, you know, uh, keep up with their addiction. So what are some of the tools to counter abuse? Um, this is just something that pretty much any pharmacist can use, especially community pharmacists. I really urge you to take advantage of the Michigan Automated Prescription System, or MAPS. Um, MAPS is a tremendous resource. Um, I think one of the very first things I did when I got my pharmacist license is I went out and finally got a MAPS password. Um, MAPS is a great system. Um, all you need is a name and a birth date. And you go into the MAPS system, you know, as long as you have a password. And the only people that can get passwords are, you know, doctors, pharmacists, and some law enforcement um, personnel can get it as well. Um, but you go into the system, you put in the patient's information, and literally within about five minutes, you'll get a very comprehensive report of um, all of the controlled substance they have gotten at any pharmacy in the state of Michigan. And I think those reports have to be updated. It's at least several times a week, and it may be even up to daily at this point. But um, again, it'll give you this really great picture of all the controlled substances they've gotten at all Michigan pharmacies. It'll give you, you know, who prescribed it, what did they get, how much did they get. It'll tell you whether or not they paid cash or, you know, paid for through their insurance. I mean, it, it's really a wealth of information. And if you get any um, sort of prescription that's maybe a little suspicious looking, um, I highly recommend it, you know, if you can. And I realize community pharmacists, pharmacists are incredibly busy. But if you can, you know, you might want to check maps and kind of see what's going on with this patient. Um, I, I used to do it all the time, and um, we do use it in managed care as well. Um, it's a really great system. Um, I know uh, MAPS is what's called a PMP, a prescription monitoring program. Um, all states except Missouri, for some reason, have a PMP, and I know um, they are trying to link this, because, you know, now the each PMP goes by the state, and you're kind of isolated, like, you know, you go into maps and you can't see scripts filled in like Ohio over the state borderline. Um, I do know that there is a movement to try and link the map systems so, you know, you can see, you know, especially if you're in kind of near a border, you can see um, what, pe you know, what scripts people got in Ohio or, you know, in other states. Um, 
ultimately we'd actually kind of like to see a PMP that's just national and not, you know, by state boundaries. But, um, you know, the, the state programs are a really good start. And um, another way that managed care pharmacists help with fraud, waste, and abuse is uh, managed care pharmacists can keep doctors aware of opiate issues. In fact, for Medicare, which is what I work in, it is required by CMS that we notify doctors whose uh, patients, um, not cancer patients, you know, cancer patients get excluded, but patients who have, you know, things like back pain and stuff like that, if they're on very excessive doses of opiates, if they're going to multiple doctors, multiple pharmacists, you know, doctor and pharmacy shopping, we have to, we as a plan have to report that to the doctors and let them know. So um, that's uh, a, definitely a role that managed care pharmacists are pretty comfortable with. Now one business role that I think is kind of maybe a little bit more unique to managed care pharmacists as opposed to pharmacists and hospital retail is kind of our business role. Um, data management is huge. Everything we do is driven by data. Um, data tells us what initiatives we need to um, undertake and are they working and where we should put our resources. Um, I cannot overemphasize the importance of data and what a managed care pharmacist does. Um, we also uh, have a marketing role. Um, you know, when, a, uh, when your marketing department at a plan is trying to solicit group business, um, you know, the pharmacist plays a role in that as well. Um, and you may have to answer what's called a request for proposal. You can get that from a group. Information about the drug plan and the managed care pharmacist can provide that. Um, also ensuring return on investment of pharmacy initiatives. Um, I know in my position, um, there's quite a big spotlight on everything we do. We really need to prove value that um, what we're doing um, is paying off and is worthwhile. And so we constantly need to report back to our senior leadership and show that ROI, show that, you know, this money that we're spending on whatever initiative it is, um, we're getting that money back in terms of, you know, either medical savings or, you know, whatever. Um, quality improvement, which again is kind of my specialty, um, Medicare plan quality improvement is also a uh, big part of managed care pharmacy. Um, this kind of goes along with the general medical trend of outcomes-based reimbursement. Um, you know, kind of as I always explain it to my students, you know, in fee-for-service land, and there is still some fee-for-service, but it is kind of going away, um, you know, people got paid to do stuff. And whether that stuff was good or bad, the more stuff they did, the more money they got paid. And that was true in the lab and procedures and drugs and everything. And uh, we're kind of moving away from that because that's really not sustainable and it leads to a lot of waste. And so now we're moving towards outcomes-based reimbursement where, um, you know, you're not going to be paid for all the stuff you do, but you're going to be paid for the value you provide. Um, payment will not be volume-based, but it's all about improving patient outcomes. And, um, you know, the pharmacy is definitely not going to be immune from this. And um, pharmacists actually have a really great opportunity, especially, um, you know, pharmacists, especially the ones coming out of school now who have a lot of clinical training and a lot of training in, you know, talking to patients. Pharmacists are in a really great position to improve um, patient outcomes through patient and provider education. Um, especially for things like medication adherence, which are huge to the plans. Um, I'll talk about those in a little bit. But just in terms of, you know, drug interactions and, you know, managing side effects and, you know, saving money, um, all sorts of things. Pharmacists are in a really great spot to influence all of that. So some of the quality scales that are kind of, you know, most pervasive in managed care pharmacy is something called HEDIS. Um, you know, some of you may or may not have heard of HEDIS. HEDIS stands for the Healthcare Effectiveness Data and Information Set. Um, HEDIS is a set of quality ratings um, that are put forth by NCQA, the National Center for Quality Assurance. Um, health plans and, you know, several other entities um, really strive to get NCQA accredited, so it's very important. Um, HEDIS rankings are also used for the yearly health plan ranking issue of consumer reports, which, you know, a lot of plans, um, the one plan I used to work in, they really looked forward to that consumer reports issue coming out every year, and they would, um, you know, that, that was a really important goal for the plan to uh, score well in HEDIS so they could score well in consumer reports. 
Um, and there are several measures um, within HEDIS, uh, medications for COPD, asthma, hypertension, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoporosis, and the list kind of goes on and on and on. Um, there's a lot of different HEDIS measures that are pharmacy related. Um, and then also um, a lot of the HEDIS measures cross over to the STARS measures, which I'm going to talk about next. Um, STARS measures are basically my whole job um, at Blue Cross. So what are the STARS measures? And I'm sure a lot of you have kind of been hearing a lot about the STARS measures. Um, STARS measures are a Medicare Advantage plan quality scale. Um, plans are rated from one to five stars. You know, it's kind of like rating hotels, restaurants, stuff like that. Um, all Medicare Advantage plans are rated on the scale by CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the federal government. Um, you want to be a, as close to a five-star plan as possible. It is very difficult to be a five-star plan. There's something like several hundred plans in the U.S., and I believe only 11 plans were five-star last year. And unfortunately, my plan was not one of them. Um, to my knowledge, there are no five-star plans in the state of Michigan right now. Um, but again, five-star is very challenging. Um, we are currently at four-star right now, which is still very good. Um, and as of right now, and this changes all the time, but as of right now, there's 48 different star measures. Um, 32 are Part C, so those are you know more the medical measures, um, and then 16 are the Part D, which are the pharmacy measures. And um, there, but but a lot of the Part C measures have a pharmacy component, and um, the the stars measures are have a couple different domains. Um, they also you know besides clinical pharmacy measures or in clinical you know medical measures, um, the medical measures measure things like you know 30 day readmits and blood pressure and A1C control things like that. But they also look at you know how quickly do you enroll new members and do you have, um, you know, facilities available for non-English speakers or, you know, deaf members that, you know, want to, um, you know, communicate with someone at the plant? Do you have resources available to help those people? Um, they also have, um, you know, patient satisfaction type things. So there's a lot of different things they're measuring, but um, my role is mostly on the five Part D clinical measures. Um, and uh, STARS is a really big deal to all the Medicare plans because um, for a couple different reasons. Um, when people go online and look at your plan on the Medicare Plan Finder site, the STAR rating is on there. Um, so, you know, that can be really important to some people. Um, how you do in STARS does um, determine your reimbursements from the federal government. But probably the most important reason is that plans that stay below three stars for three consecutive years can have their contracts revoked by CMS. You will not be allowed to be a Medicare plan anymore. So, um, you know, doing well in the stars is vitally important for any Medicare plan out there. So what kind of make up the five clinical pharmacy star measures? Um, so there's three adherence measures, which, um, again, I think that, uh, you know, especially community pharmacists are in a really good position. Um, to help out with. Um, right now, the three medications uh, that we measure adherence for are the statins, um, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and the diabetes medications. The diabetes meds is pretty much almost every diabetes medication except insulin, since insulin doesn't really have standardized dosing. It's very um, individualized for each person. Um, but they do all the orals, and then they also do Bieta, Victoza, and Bidurion, and Tanzium. Um, God, that category just keeps getting bigger. Um, the adherence measures are also very important because they're part of the QRS, the quality rating system for the exchange plans. So now, um, you know, it's not just Medicare, it's also the commercial plans that are looking at these medication adherence uh, measures as well. Then um, the uh, fourth measure that's uh, looked at for clinical pharmacy stars is the diabetes treatment measure which is the use of ACE and ARBs um, in hypertensive diabetics. Now, um, we actually just found out um, there's an organization called PQA, the Pharmacy Quality Alliance. They basically write these measures. Um, they, you know, their whole kind of reason for existence is developing pharmacy quality measures, and then they license the measures to CMS, who uses them for star measures. And um, PQA actually retired this uh, diabetes treatment measure. We call it DT for short. They retired the DT measure in January. Um, we're hearing, we're waiting to hear from CMS as to whether they are going to retire the measure as well. Pretty much everyone says they will, but you know we have to wait for the official word from CMS. 
Um, basically, this one's getting retired because it doesn't jive with the current um, hypertension guidelines anymore. So um, we're kind of looking forward to that one going away because it's been very challenging for us for a variety of reasons. Um, then you have the high-risk medication use in older adults. This is drugs from the Beers List. Um, Beers List is maintained by the American Geriatric Society. Um, it's developed by Dr. Mark Beers in the early 90s. It's a list of drugs that, as a general rule, should not be used in patients 65 and older. Um, now, there's over 60 drugs on the high-risk med list. Um, for better or worse, uh, about six different categories make up about 90% of the fills. This is for my plan, but it's pretty much true across the board from what I've seen. Um, ambient and estrogen, and remember this is in people 65 and older, ambient and estrogen make up over half of the fills for my plan and quite honestly for most other people's plans. These, those are the two drugs we have the most problems with. And um, if any of you have ever tried to talk anyone out of taking Ambien or you know someone who's been on estrogen for years and years, tried to get them off of it, it is very difficult. Um, also the tricyclic antidepressants, um, not all of them. The big one that we're trying to get people off is Elevil because it's very anticholinergic and it can lead to all sorts of problems in older people. Um, the muscle relaxants, um, this one's sort of like Ambien. You know, Ambien's okay for short-term use, and by short-term I mean 90 days or less. Um, but I see people all the time that have been on Ambien for years, which is really not appropriate. Um, it's the same thing with the muscle relaxants. Those should be used short-term. People should not be on those for years and years and years as a general rule. Um, digoxin, that one's dose-related um, in people 65 and up. Um, you know, all the guidelines state that having uh, someone 65 years and older on a digoxin dose of greater than 0.125 milligrams a day does not lead to any sort of improved outcomes. It just leads to more side effects. And uh, digoxin is a very narrow therapeutic index drug. So um, there's a very fine line between a toxic dose and a therapeutic dose. So you've got to be really careful with the dosing on that drug. And then gliburide. Um, this one, um, we actually took it off the formulary, and so we're seeing less use of it. Um, the big reason why you don't want to use this drug is it's got a much higher risk of hypoglycemia than some of the other um, sulfonylureas, like uh, glipizide. And, um, you know, you, you just don't, you just kind of want to stay away from gliburide. There's a lot better choices out there, and especially in the elderly, you know, hypoglycemia can be especially deadly. So, um, but as I said before, you know, we're, we're we're seeing uh, reduced use of that drug, and I'm hoping that trend continues. Um, another uh, big area for managed care pharmacy, and then especially Medicare pharmacy, is medication therapy management, or MTM. Um, some of you may have um, delivered MTM services in your practice. Um, MTM is um, generally thought of as a program to optimize patient medication regimens. Um, MTM can be face-to-face -face or it can be telephonic. Um, you could also do it through something like Skype as well. Um, between a patient and a pharmacist to discuss all their medications. And um, I've done MTM sessions. Um, they can be very satisfying, but they are very time-consuming. They're usually at least a half hour minimum. And you just you have a list of their meds and you just go through all their meds. And um, you know, you address, you know, why are you taking this? You know, do you know why you're taking this? Um, and when do you take it? And how do you take it? And you know. And you're, you're looking for any sort of drug-related problems like interactions, improper dosages, you know, that kind of thing. And then you do a nice big write-up and you send it to the patient and, um, you know, uh, hopefully you can send it to their physician or their uh, primary care provider as well. And um, again, per CMS rules, all MEBD plans must offer MTM services to qualified members. You don't have to offer it to everybody. And there are certain, um, you have to submit your MTM plan to CMS the spring, like the spring of the following year. Like for example, you know, this spring we're going to be working on our MTM program for 2016, which we're going to have to submit usually around Easter time. And that determines, you know, who, who you're going to qualify. And uh, it's determined based on, you know, how many drugs somebody takes, how many chronic diseases they have, and um, what their average annual drug spend is going to be. And MTM services are kind of supposed to be um, reserved for kind of your sicker patients that can hopefully benefit, benefit from it more. Now there are a lot of issues that are kind of unique to Part D as opposed to, you know, like commercial or Medicaid. Um, B versus D is probably the biggest one. You know, D is for drugs, Part D is the drug plan. A lot of drugs are covered under D, but there are lots of exceptions. 
Um, a lot of drugs are also covered under B. So, um, and again, these are just a few examples. There's always lots of exceptions. Um, any drug administered via durable medical equipment, so like albuterol in a nebulizer, like not, you know, not like Pro-Air or anything like that, like, you know, albuterol that you put in a nebulizer or insulin you use in a pump, not with a needle, like a regular syringe. Those are covered under Part B as in boy. Um, drugs administered in a physician's office, so like things that are kind of infused, um, stuff like that, those are usually covered under Part B as in boy. Um, also, uh, doctors don't know how to bill Part D. Um, we run into that, um, we run into a lot of problems with that with the shingles vaccine, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. Immunosuppressants for transplant patients, um, for some reason, those are covered under Part B as in boy. Um, and then also, and this is a really kind of a nitpicky one, oral antiemetics used for cancer patients within 48 hours of chemotherapy. Um, you know, we run into this a lot. This is a very problematic for the plan, and again, this is a CMS rule. There's nothing we can do about it. Zofran, anytime you have a Medicare patient, this is for the community pharmacist, Anytime you have a Medicare patient come into your pharmacy with a script for Zofran um, and, you, and you run it under their Medicare benefit, you are going to get an error message. Um, and it's going to you know, probably say something like you know, B versus D. Because if they're just using Zofran because you know, they got an upset stomach or you know, whatever, it's going to be covered under D as in dog. If that Zofran is being used as part of a chemo regimen, it's going to be covered under B as in boy. And, you know, again, this is a CMS rule. There's nothing the plan can do about it. And you got to call up the plan and, you know, uh, tell them, hey, you know, this is why the patient's using it. And, of course, you have to find out from the patient why they're using it as well. And then the plan can do um, an override and bill it to the appropriate, you know, part. Um, and the, this, we get this problem a lot. Please do not tell them that Blue Cross does not cover Zofran. We do cover Zofran. I think every... I think every drug plan covers Zofran, and especially for Medicare, because we're so tightly regulated by CMS. Um, it's a B versus D issue. You need to call the plan and do the override. And unfortunately, there's no way around it. But we, we run into this problem a lot, and it's, it's caused a lot of grief for everybody. So um, please, please, please call the plan when a Medicare patient comes in with a script for Zofran. Um, vaccines. So again, more B versus D issues. The flu shot and the pneumonia shot are always, always, always part B as in boy, no exceptions. One of the few no exceptions rules in Medicare. Um, vaccines given what they call incident in a, to an exposure are always part B. So for example, you know, if you stepped on a rusty nail and you need a tetanus shot because you stepped on a rusty nail, that is what we call incident to an exposure. You know, you underwent some event that caused you to be possibly exposed to um, you know, tetanus. So that, that drug is going to be billed under Part B as in boy. However, if you get a tetanus shot just because you haven't had a tetanus shot in 10 years, that will be billed under Part D as in dog. So again, this gets really confusing. I've worked in Medicare for three years and even I'm confused by it. So um, it, it, it takes a long time to really wrap your head around. Um, all other vaccines are Part D. Um, this is kind of my anecdote about the shingles vaccine. Um, we love, 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 love it when people get vaccinated for shingles at the pharmacy because shingles uh, vaccine, Zostavax, is only, that, that's one where there is no exception. It's always billed under D as in dog. Doctors do not know how to bill for Part D. So we've had a lot of situations where, um, you know, a, as a lot of you know, Zostavax is not cheap. It's about a $200 vaccine. And if somebody goes in the pharmacy, and, um, you know, it's covered under their Medicare, and they pay their $10 copay, and they're on their way, and everybody's happy. Well, a lot of times what happens is if a Medicare patient gets the vaccine at the doctor's office, the people at the doctor's office may or may not have explained to this person that, you know, we can't bill it. You're, you know, you're going to have to, we're going to bill you for it later on, and then you're going to have to submit it to your insurance company for reimbursement. And we get all these phone calls from, you know, crying little old ladies on the phone saying they just got a bill from their doctor for the shingles shot for $200, and oh my God, what are they going to do? So, so um, we really encourage people to get the shingles shot at the pharmacy because um, then, you know, it will go through 
and everything will be fine. So um, the B versus D thing is a big issue. Um, there's also what we call Part D excluded drugs, and again, this is CMS rules. This does not you know, have anything to do with us. Um, anything uh, cosmetic, so any sort of weight loss drug that comes out, um, Medicare does not cover. Um, anything for hair growth, like, um, oh my gosh, I just blanked out on the name. Um, the hair, um, I can't remember it. Um, it's sold over the counter now. Um, anything for hair growth um, or stuff like Vanica, which is used to get rid of hair. Medicare does not cover. Uh, Rogaine, that was the drug I was trying to think of. Um, anything for cough and cold, except, and again, this is except for, except for chronic illnesses. So, you know, cough and cold, you know, a lot of times if somebody's trying to get, well, Tushinex is kind of a bad example because it's a C2 now, but um, something like, you know, promethazine with codeine, um, it's usually not going to be covered. Um, if somebody has, you know, a chronic illness, you know, there might be an exception. Um, there's also an exception if, um, if somebody's not getting original Medicare, they're getting Medicare through, like, um, an employer, and it's, um, they'll have, like, a separate rider where the employer will pay for cough and cold. Again, it gets really confusing. But um, as a general rule, Medicare does not pay for cough and cold. Um, they also do not pay for erectile dysfunction drugs except because of all, there's always an exception, except Cialis for BPH, but it's only Cialis for BPH, so you have to use, you know, um, the BPH strength, and usually, you know, there has to be some sort of documentation from the doctor that this is being used for BPH and it's not being used for ED. Medicare Part D also has um, a whole lot of compliance issues that um, other plans don't really have to deal with right now. Um, Anybody who works for a Medicare plan has to have a fairly thorough understanding of the unique Part D rules and regs, um, you know, in terms of um, things like, you know, when, when a member submits um, a coverage determination, it has to be processed within a certain amount of time or we get in trouble with CMS. Um, we have this whole section called CDAG, Coverage Determinations, Appeals, and Grievances, and again, things have to be processed timely. Um, there's a whole step process to how coverage determinations are handled, and especially if there's, you know, if we deny something and the patient appeals, um, everything's got to be done exactly the way that CMS wants. Um, uh, this also extends to operations. You know, again, I was mentioning the STARS measures earlier for things like, um, you know, foreign language and, um, you know, things for deaf people, things like that, and just plain old claims processing, all of that needs to be done, and CMS watches everything we do. Um, any sort of vendor oversight, so any, anything, any function that we vendor out, um, the vendor's not responsible. We are ultimately responsible for anything we vendor out, so we need to oversee our vendors, and we do a lot of internal audits to make sure our vendors are uh, keeping up with CMS compliance rules. And then also the pharmacy benefit managers, um, again, that ties into vendor oversight. You know, again, we have to make sure that they are in compliance with CMS uh, rules and regs as well. So um, just some kind of a grab bag of what are some of the additional managed care pharmacist roles, um, contracting with and managing pharmacy networks, um, academic detailing, which, um, so for those of you who are not familiar with academic detailing, um, kind of an old term, um, but when a pharma rep goes to a doctor's office and tell them, tells them about, you know, the newest, coolest product on the block, it's known as detailing. Academic detailing is when you take a clinical person, sometimes a pharmacist, but it could also be like a nurse or a physician or a PA, someone like that, and send them to a doctor's office to basically um, teach them the newest evidence-based guidelines and things like that. Um, pharmacists, uh, some pharmacists are very much adept at academic detailing. I've done a little bit. Um, it, it can be a really rewarding um, career path. And I think it's a program that um, will get more and more popular with all these outcomes-based payment models that are coming down the pike. Um, again, building, building clinical initiatives for STARS, HEDIS, and QRS, as we spoke about before, you know, kind of building the initiatives that you need to, uh, for the plan to improve those measures. Um, conducting outcomes research, so again, you know, all the programs, all the initiatives we're doing, do they work? Um, so you need to do, you know, some research to see if they are really working the way that they're supposed to. Um, designing and marketing pharmacy benefits, again, you know, this is for the group presentations, um, trying to get new business for the plan. 
encouraging cost-effective use of medications, which is kind of overall, and then participating in care management, health and wellness, um, you know, again, just kind of general, um, you know, encouraging, you know, better health outcomes for our members. Um, so if you're interested in managed care, um, you know, kind of what, what sort of things do we look for in a managed care pharmacist? Um, excellent verbal and written communication skills. I cannot stress this enough. Um, I have seen so many pharmacist resumes where, you know, I, I just will not hire that person because even the resume is poorly written. Um, everything we do is written communication, you know, writing newsletter articles, writing communications to send to members and doctors. You've got to be able to write well to work in managed care. Um, if you're just doing a PA, you know, PA pharmacist, maybe not so much, but if you're doing kind of more a managerial role or you're working on projects, you've got to be able to write well. Um, you've got to have really good computer skills. Um, you don't have to know how to program or anything like that, but you need to know your way around, you know, Microsoft Office, and you definitely need um, pretty good Internet uh, research skills. Um, drug information background, again, that kind of goes along with the, um, you know, Internet research skills, you know, being able to look things up in Medline and things like that. Just basic clinical skills, um, being able to talk to doctors on their level and, you know, gaining their trust and respect, um, you've got to have the clinical background to be able to do that. Um, you do have to have some business acumen because, again, you know, um, pharmacists and managed care many times have to report to business people, um, you know, kind of CFOs, vice presidents, you know, things like that, and those people do not have a clinical background, but, um, you know, a lot of them do have a financial background, so you have to make sure that what you're doing is worthwhile to the plan in a monetary sense. Um, public speaking, again, is very important. You often have to give presentations to doctors and then even other groups within the plan. So that's something you really need to be good at as well. Um, you do not get a whole lot of patient contact. It is a desk job. So um, I know one of my best friends from pharmacy school, she works in an independent pharmacy. She does not know how I can do this. She says that sitting at a desk all day would drive her nuts. Um, and she loves her patients. Um, you know, I, I really enjoy what I do. Um, I don't get much patient contact, but I kind of think of it more as um, population health, managing, you know, very large populations of people, and uh, I feel I can do a lot of good in that sense. So um, for those of you, um, especially students out there, who think, hey, you know, this sounds pretty good. I'd really like to pursue a career in managed care. Um, how do I go about it? Um, for students, um, uh, we um, at Blue Cross we do offer a paid summer internship at the end of your P2 year. Um, also, I know that um, Blue Cross. Then I know some of the other um, health plans do offer P4 internships for your fourth year in pharmacy school, um, five or six week rotations depending on what pharmacy school you're going to. Um, you can learn quite a lot in uh, five to six weeks, believe it or not. Um, there are also managed care residencies um, right now. Um, as far as I know, Blue Cross has the only managed care residency in the state of Michigan, and um, last time my intern told me there were only um, about 40, 40 to 50 managed care residencies in the whole country. So there aren't a whole lot of them, but if you're really interested, that might be something you might want to pursue. And then there are also uh, fellowships out there as well. Um, one other thing, especially if you know, you're maybe a little further on in your career, Something that might be helpful is um, a, an, another degree in addition to an RPH or a PharmD, like public health, law, or business. Those can um, often be very helpful in the managed care environment. Um, AMCP, the Academy of Managed Care Pharmacy, does have a certificate program. And then um, also engaging in managed care related activities in your current work setting, such as thing as MTM or you know, doing outcomes research if you work in a hospital or something like that. Um, Pharmacists are definitely needed in managed care um, to manage increasingly expensive and complex meds through utilization management and benefit design to help control utilization of opiates and other um, inappropriate utilization and to improve patient outcomes um, through, and this is basically, if, if people ask me in one sentence what I do, it's influencing patient and prescriber behavior and then also by providing MTM services is another way um, managed care pharmacists can help improve patient outcomes. Um, I thank you all for your attention. Does anyone have any questions?
Uh, this is Mary. I'm sorry. I was having trouble unmuting myself. Um, I'm going to unmute everyone so that you can ask questions. So give me just a moment. I'll let you know when it's unmuted. Okay, everyone has been unmuted, so you can feel free to ask questions. Uh, we got one written question, Kim. Did you mention that Blue Cross Blue Shield can, or excuse me, did you mention that Blue Cross Blue Shield carry residency program? Yes, we do have a residency program. Um, right now, we're accepting one resident per year. Um, I know that they're doing, um, usually the, the residency program, how it works is um, we usually start taking the applications um, at the beginning of the year. I believe the deadline for applications for this coming year was in January. Um, it's a pretty rigorous process. Um, you have to apply through this um, uh, this computer system called Forecast, um, and you have to give all this documentation. You have to you know your grades. You have to write a personal statement. You need recommendation letters. You need all this documentation. And um, then the you know the the residency program is in the commercial um, part. It's not in Medicare, although I'm hoping to have a resident in Medicare um, in the future. But uh, so they go through all this documentation. They're going to start doing interviews around now. Um, so, you know, February they'll do interviews and then they'll select their resident, you know, sometime in the spring. And then the residents usually start in like late June, early July, and it's one whole year. Um, and uh, they, they work you into the ground. Um, you know, it's kind of, it's a little bit like a medical residency, you know. Um, you're definitely going to be working over 40 hours a week. You're going to have a big research project to do. Um, it is very rigorous, but um, it's really going to give you really good prep towards what managed care is like, and it's, and it's going to give you a really good start to a managed care career if that's what you're interested in. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Kim, how long have you been with Blue Cross, and what was your experience prior to that? Okay. Um, I've been with Blue Cross about three years. Um, I was at a Medicaid plan for about a year and a half before I was at Blue Cross. Um, before that, I did community pharmacy for about a year. And before that, I, you know, did, I, I went to pharmacy school later in life. Before that, I was in med tech, and I worked in advertising, and I did a bunch of different things. So, um, I, but uh, it, it can be difficult to get a managed care pharmacy job right out of school unless, you know, you've done an internship or residency and stuff like that. Um, you know, there, there aren't so many managed care jobs out there. And, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have heard that, you know, the pharmacy job market has really tightened up in the last five years. Um, there really seems to be, especially in, you know, urban areas like southeastern Michigan, there does seem to be kind of a glut of pharmacists right now. So um, for me as an employer, I can be really picky. And I am, quite honestly, when I'm looking for people. So, um, you know, it, it can be tough. It's not impossible, but it, it can be tough um, getting a job in managed care. I mean, like I said, it, it took me a little while before I got one. So. It, and, and I had done a summer internship class when I was in pharmacy school. And I'm, I'm, that was a big reason why I got hired. Um, I worked at Blue Care Network all summer. Um, I had made friends, people remembered me, I left a good impression, and so five years later, I got hired. But it was not easy. So, but I, I really enjoy the work I do. Okay, we have Any another question. We do have another question. Uh, okay. One was sent to us. How do you anticipate managed care plans will handle the high-cost drugs moving forward? That is a really good question. The answer is, I have no idea. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned before, and you know, the prices are just really out of control. And um, 
you know, when you look at health systems, I, I kind of, you know, am, as an amateur study kind of healthcare systems around the world, and the U.S. pays more for prescription drugs than any other country on earth, and pharma, pharma can basically, they can price these drugs however they want, and there's no sort of control. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, we've been using the same utilization management tools for quite a while, but those tools are not good especially, you know, if it's a drug that people really need for something like cancer, you know, how can we do it? Um, I mean, unfortunately, um, I think part of it is going to, one trend we've already seen is um, more of the drug burden is being shifted onto the patient, and that's really unfortunate, and I hate to see that happen, but, um, you know, it, it is a strategy that a lot of plans are pursuing, and, um, you know, there's got to be a break breaking point eventually. I mean, the, the cost of these meds is just, I mean, it's its mind-boggling. So, yeah, I, I, quite honestly, the answer to that is I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Um, sort of congressional action, you know, I have no idea how we're going to pay for this stuff. It's really, it's kind of frightening. Um, and I know, I'm sure, some of our senior executives that keeps them up at night. So, um, keep working on it. What can I say? Does anyone else have any other questions? Okay. Looks like uh, no one else has any questions. You know what? I, just, I just saw another question. Um, to what do you attribute the rising cost of generics? Um, that's a really good question as well. You know, we've seen prices for things like digoxin and things just really go up. Um, then, you know, the answer is kind of half, I don't know, but it's also kind of half um, because drug manufacturers can charge whatever they want and there's really no limits. Um, and, you know, I, I think part of it too is due to the, um, uh, the like um, drug companies buying up other drug companies, like lack of competition, you know, a lot of smaller drug companies get swallowed up by bigger companies, and even some big companies get swallowed up by bigger companies. So you get to the point where there's only one or two companies making a certain drug, and there's no competition for the price for something like a generic. So, um, you know, that's, I think that's part of the problem as well. But yeah, I mean, pharma can charge whatever they want. I mean, that's, that's at the end of the day, that's that's the truth of it. So, you know, um, we've had a lot of shortages. You know, there have been a lot of FDA issues in terms of the you know, compounding center and, you know, um, manufacturing problems. And, I mean, there's a lot of things going on. I, mean, I just saw a um, shortage in normal saline, which I couldn't believe. So, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of problems in the supply chain as well. <laughs> Does anyone else have any other questions? I'm okay. Hey, look at that. Okay, Hi. well, Kim, I'd like to thank you for uh, giving this presentation and thank everyone for participating. Uh, with that, you can expect to see the evaluation and post-test emailed to you before the end of this. Hey, and um, have a great evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.